But how many of you guys like to see, go to movies? You guys like to go watch movies and stuff like that? I noticed that, uh, I think there's a new Transformers coming out pretty soon. One of my favorite. Yes, one of my favorite ones. But um, we're going to look at something a little different here today. And uh, we're not talking about Transformers. But if you've noticed, and I don't know if you saw that too, I was pretty excited about how that kind of unveiled itself. Let's go. So, and if, you, if you've not been around me very much, you know it doesn't take too much to excite me, and that excites me. So when I found that. But if you've noticed, and I, what I did, I kind of did some uh, research on the top Christian movies. And, you know, it's my best friend Google out there can pretty much tell you anything that you want, even stuff you don't want. But Passion of the Christ, a little bit older one, but $370 million it made at the box office. Man. Worldwide, $609 million. But to give you an idea of where that ranks on the movies of all time, anybody know um, how much Avatar brought in worldwide? Billion or two. $2.8 billion. So, Passion of Christ, that did come in, and I can't remember I had it. it was near like G.I. Joe, which I was pretty excited about. <laughs> so that was one of my favorite movies. But just to kind of give you a rundown, you got numbers two through four was the Chronicles of Narnia series, and they, as a, as a total, kind of made $550 million. Heaven is for Real at five eighty nine. God's Not Dead, sixty. so pretty cool about that. Um, Son of God, 59. Soul Surfer, 43. And Courageous and Fireproof, one made 33, one made $34 million. And for you, I'm in love with a church girl fan, 2.3 million. That was enough to get it 38. And uh, to save a life, which was 28 um, at 3.7. And if Noah, it's not even included on here, but Noah actually did $101 million. And I'm not saying that didn't make a Christian movie um, top, top, top list. So the reason I wanted to show that is because we're, we're seeing so many more Christian movies at the theaters. There are so many more. And, um, you know, one, people are searching. They want to know truth. They, and, and sometimes we, we look to different places. But, um, but also we're seeing they're making money. You know, that's not always been the case. So some of these companies that are getting behind these films and we put them out. But earlier this year, this number five, Heaven is for Real, and if you, if you heard the story, I think this actually goes back to about maybe 2002 or something like that. A little four-year-old boy named Colton, um, he was the son of a pastor in, uh, in Nebraska. His appendix burst and he went into, the, went into the hospital and had surgery. And while he was in, during surgery, um, they, I think they lost him. That he, he, he may have got on the table or something like that. And he says that he saw heaven. He went to heaven, may have seen... That his, his dad's father and his sister that never was, was born. And I'm not calling the little boy someone telling him, I don't know what happened. But here's the, the reason I wanted to point that out is because when we think of heaven and if you kind of follow along we don't have to go to the movies to hear this account of a four year old we can go to scripture and see what scripture says. And that's what I really want to look at today because heaven is for real. And we are going to talk about that today, but it's so important that we don't necessarily, not that he may not be telling the truth, but for the things that we want to trust, we can trust God's Word. And that's what we're going to look at today. So, um, it seemed like a good movie. I think I even cried watching the, the previews of it when I, I'm a, kind of a baby when it comes to that stuff. But at the same time, we're going to look to see what God's Word has to say about heaven, not what Corey will. Let's pray and then we're going to get into some scripture. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that heaven is a real place. Lord, we thank you that people are willing to talk about it, Lord, and not to take anything away from that, Lord. But I pray that when it comes to truth, Lord, we look to your word for it. And I pray that you just use me today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to be camped in Revelation 20, 21. So I'm going to have some of the verses on the screen. But if you have a Bible, if you want to go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 21, because uh, some of it's not actually going to be on the screen, because we're going to look at um, some verses here today, and I want us to get a good, good picture of what we're seeing. So Revelation chapter 21, 
Uh, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to look kind of through verse 6, and then move around a little bit, 20, maybe even 22, to really get a full picture of what, what the Bible says about heaven. But it's Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1 and 2. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And we could stop right there, we could leave, and we could feel good about ourselves. We could know that their heaven is real. We see this John, is, he has been kind of sent out to the island of Patmos, and, and he's receiving these visions from God about what heaven is, is like. But uh, what we miss, chapter 21 starts here, but we miss what's going on before. And I think it's so important that when we look at this, we don't get all warm and fuzzy feeling about this here. This is certainly true. But if we back up just a little bit, the first thing that we really see happening before we see about heaven we see that judgment comes first. And that's why when we look at this, that it's so important that we get the total picture and not just a part of it. And when we start looking at judgment, one, it gets kind of scary. Because the Bible says, and we're going to look at some verses, but in chapter 20, verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And now all of a sudden, we start getting kind of concerned. It says that we are going to be judged according to what we have done. But two other places we also see judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the, the body, whether good or bad. We see this judgment. We also see in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, But I tell you that men will have to give an account on that day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Now, I don't know about you, but I try to picture myself going through the line when it comes to my time. Some of you guys are going to have to wait a while. Because when I have to go through and talk about every careless word that I've spoken, or every deed that I've done, it's going to take some time. The thing that I want us to realize, because one, when we look at these things, and I have some other verses too that I want to, I'm going to read them out of my Bible. I don't have them up on the screen, but the first one, well, I'm going to skip verse 15 because 21 verse 8 in Revelation. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Jump down to verse 27. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. And then in verse 15 in chapter 22. Outside the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Some of you guys are thinking, what are you doing up there talking about this stuff? Well, this is true. But what we have to realize, if you notice, these are things done in the past. These aren't what we're doing now. These are done in the past. And we all have things that we wish we wouldn't have done. That we wish that if we could go back and that we could do a redo, that we wouldn't have to. Have to have, or we wouldn't have done it that way. When, when John is talking about these here, it's not about our past because we have all done things in our past that we wish we could, that we could not do, that we wouldn't have. What this is describing as far as those that are, that are going in, that, that they don't make it. Because we know that through Christ, there is forgiveness. And there is forgiveness that covers any sin imaginable. So we don't have to, it's not something, Satan continually reminds us about those things. God does it. So for us, but I want us to think of as far, because we're not saved by our actions. We're saved by faith. But we also look to scripture and we can see faith, and works how they go together. So we have to ask ourselves, we say we have faith, but do we also live like this? Because if we do, those two things don't match. So it's so important that we realize when we have faith, true faith, our life begins to change. That doesn't mean that we're, that we're perfect. That means that we try to, to be like Christ, 
But when we look at, at Scripture, before we can be celebrating as heaven is coming down and what it's going to be like, we're going to look at some really cool verses on getting a picture of what heaven is. We have to ask ourselves, which one is describing it? It's maybe our past, but it's about our present. And the thing about it is, we, we all have struggles that we deal with, but when it comes down to it, John is talking about those that will not enter into heaven. My goal is, and I know that when we look at Scripture, in 2 Peter, it talks about, I think it's in 2 Peter, where it says that, that God is patient or He is slow, wanting everyone to come to repentance. So we, we want to see that. But the first thing that we need to realize before we celebrate heaven, that judgment is real, hell is a real place. We know, we see, the Bible actually talks more about hell than it does heaven. But for us today, heaven is real. And when we face, when we die, which every one of us in here will, the question is, will we go to spend eternity with Him, or will we spend eternity separated from Him? That's the question. So, judgment comes first, but it's important to realize this holy city that we see coming down out of heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 says, I saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, throughout Scripture, we see heaven talked about different ways. Here, we see it talked about as far as this, this holy city, but we also see a prepared city. You go back into John 14, before Jesus goes to the cross, and uh, the disciples are starting to kind of freak out. You know, they're not sure what's going to happen. They've been following Jesus so closely over the last three and a half years. And Jesus is going to the cross, and, and Jesus tells them, Don't let, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust also in God, but trust also in me. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I'm coming back for you. The King James says it's mansions. I don't know what the mansions are going to look like in heaven, but whatever God does is going to be cool. I want to be a part of it. But we see that it is this prepared city. We also see it's a beautiful city. And I want to read this to you because what happens, a lot of times in our minds, we think what heaven's going to look like. I've been guilty of saying I think it's sometimes going to look like a golf course. You know, finely manicured, nice green, temperature about 75, low humidity, things like that. God has such a better place planned for us. Look at Revelation chapter 21, 18 through 21. And I may struggle with some of these, these fancy words, but so just bear with me. But it says, The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great city of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Fort Knox ain't got nothing on what heaven's got. So when we think of what heaven is going to be like, have a place that God has prepared for us, it's something special. You can't even really put words to describe what it is. This holy city, this prepared city, this beautiful city. But one thing about it is John uses some great descriptions on what it's going to be like. But my favorite, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I still remember, a lot of you guys know the story. Ian's already thinking, oh no, here we go. A lot of you guys know Ian and I met on a blind date, how we got married seven months later. I still remember when those doors opened up and she came through the doors. I saw my bride was prepared for me. And, you know, it makes me get, it makes me cry now just thinking about it. Anybody that has been at a wedding, the bride is always the best looking. But we see John and why he would choose these words because we know that that's what we see. And when, when John is talking about heaven coming down just as prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. That's what we're going to see. At some point, we're going to see this, this come down and, and this place will be hopefully for us out here. And it's this holy city, it's a prepared city, but it's also a beautiful city. But the important thing, maybe even more important than what it's going to look like, it's a God inhabited city. He's going to be there. Verse 3 says, and, here God's on the and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. 
They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now we know through the Old Testament, we go back to the beginning and we know through Adam and Eve that after they sin, we hear God walking through the garden coming to look for them after, after they, had, they had sinned. So we know we see God walking with them and then God kind of, kind of retreats in a, in a way. We see through the tabernacle or through the temple that God's presence is there. Only the priest who could go into the most holy of holies could actually kind of be in God's presence. Then we know in the New Testament, we know that when we are saved, that the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. Um, and then I heard a little a kid tell a joke, well, if Jesus lives in me, shouldn't he stick out? So I don't know if he sticks out, I don't know if it's like an elbow or a foot or a knee or something like that. So we see throughout Scripture where God's presence, but at this point, he's going to be there. He's going to be there right there with us. So regardless of what it looks like, I think I'd be happy to be in a shack pulling up a seat beside God and saying, you know, just being excited to be there. Um, so this God-inhabited city, it's so much more than just a, a cool place. Um, but I want to kind of, before we go too far, I've got it underlined that now the dwelling of God is with men and He will live with them. Who's them? And that's what I want to kind of think of because I want you to look around right now. Look at the people that are here today. Think, is, is this a picture of what heaven's going to look like? Is this, is it going to be, is it just our church? Are we going to be the ones that are there? Um, probably not. Um, it would be great if it was all of us there and then some. But we know from scripture that this them is so much more than just us. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 11 talks about many nations will come and be gathered with them. One of Matthew's favorite verses, Matthew 28, 19, says, Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. So we know that heaven is not just a bunch of people that look like us. It's for those people that have trusted Him. So our question has to be, what is our role in that? How do we reach those people? Because God doesn't say, or Matthew doesn't say here, then let them come to you, and then when they come to you, then sit down and talk to them and try to make disciples. No, He says, go and make disciples. And, and really the way that the verb there is, as you're going, make, make disciples. So, you know, I did a wedding, or a, I'm sorry, I did a funeral the other day, and uh, there was probably a third of the people there that weren't Hispanic. Um, I couldn't speak to them hard, hardly at all. Uh, some of you saw my post where a guy from the funeral home asked me to do a funeral for a Chinese family. They spoke zero English. Um, so I'm trying to find someone that could actually speak Chinese to, to be able to do that. But when we think of it, you know, we, we, we go to grocery with, with people, we go to movies, where we're out there. That's a picture of what heaven is going to be like. So what are, what are we doing to really fulfill the great commandment as far as going to them and trying to make them as disciples? So because, you know what, if it's so good and, it, and as we read this and we want to be a part of it, we know that we, we want those people to be a part of it. We don't want to just hold it into us to where it's just about us. So God is going to be there with His people, and we has called us to go out and reach those people as well. So it's a God-inhabited city, and then, but this is how close He is. And I couldn't come up with a word to actually describe this here, so that's why it's blank. But look at verse four in chapter twenty-one. It says, let me get in twenty-one here. It says that He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the whole order of things has passed away. He's not just some distant God. He's not just someone that we see from the very back. He's going to be so close because it says He will actually wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, I don't know about you guys, but as far as where you're at, as far as what you're going through, what kind of junk, what kind of... Um, whether you've lost someone or whether you're having relationship issues. Um, I was talking to my boss the other day and we were talking about heaven and you know what? There's not going to be any drama in heaven. How, how cool would that be? So, but the thing about it is regardless of what we're going through right now, it's going to end. When we get to that point, now that doesn't mean it's going to end on, while we're on this earth, um, but there's going to come a time where it's going to be wiped away. Where he's, he's going to be the one to actually wipe those tears. There's no more death. No more questioning why, why children pass away at an early age. Or why this happens or why this happens. We're going to know that it's going to continue. Um, that he's going to be there. And then finally, 
we get a fresh start. Going back to as far as maybe the, some of the things that we've done, some of the mistakes that we've made, look at verse 5. It says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And I don't know about you, but if you can imagine what this, this scene was like for John as far as what God showed him, but what it's going to be like for us. We see the, the God going up, wiping tears away. Um, but then we see Jesus really as far as the one from the throne saying, I got this. I'm making everything new for you. And that's what we have to realize as we go through. And as we look at Scripture, heaven is definitely real. It's a place, it's a prepared place for you. The question is, are you going to be there? What's it going to be like? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This picture of what we see as far as heaven, you know, what's that going to be like for you? Have you trusted him as your Savior? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? And no, because 1 John 1, 9 says that if we ask him that he is faithful and just and forgives us of all our sins, he wipes that away. So we get this fresh start. We really get it the day we trust Him. But we also see even the stuff that we go through life today, it's going to come to an end. And we get to celebrate with Him. You know, no more distractions by kids playing on their cell phones. No distractions from people talking to one another. It's going to be just focused worship. Just being in, in His presence. I don't know about you. I'm pretty excited about it. And we, Ann and I, just on a side note, speaking of movies... We started watching Frozen last night, and I don't know what you guys are so excited about, but we turned it off after about 10 minutes. Maybe we didn't get into it long enough, so Matt found Walk the Line, which we we watched, watched that movie, and uh, uh, one of the things that really stuck out, well, there's a lot of things that stuck out, but one of the things that really stuck out in, in that movie, when Johnny goes, um, I think, yeah, I think it was J.R. at that time, but when he went to try to get recognized the first time. And he played this song, and Brian could probably play it, but, you know, he was, he was playing, and, and the guy just stopped him. He's like, we've heard that all before. He's like, that's it? You get to play a minute? He's like, we've heard that. He's like, the, the, the real thing is, do you really believe what you're saying? Do, re, do you really believe what you're singing? And from him, he was just kind of going through the motions. And I think for us, if we really believe what we're reading about what this place is going to be like, that should change us. That should get us so excited to, one, know that there are still things that God wants us to do, but there is a place for those who trust Him, those that are His people. So, the question is, are you going to be one of those people? One, we might think of what that judgment is going to be like. It's going to be uncomfortable, but at the same time, the reward that we know that is waiting for those who have trusted. It's going to be worth it. Let's pray.